Hello, and welcome to the Earthside Echo, your source for all the latest dispatches from Earthside. This is a time of great upheaval, friends, and we would do well to remember how the world came to be in this state. On tonight's program, we have a short but fascinating history lesson. I'm sure you will enjoy it. The setting. The other side is set on an alternate Earth in the year 1906. It is a world similar to our own, with a few notable differences, the most significant of which is the existence of Malifaux. While many people like to believe that humanity discovered Malifaux, the truth is much different. It was the denizens of Malifaux who discovered us. Thousands of years ago, a great and terrible entity hurled itself across reality, travelling from its native dimension of Malifaux to our own Earth. This entity slammed into Mount Etna like a meteor, triggering a massive volcanic landslide and a mega-tsunami that devastated the eastern Mediterranean coastline. Weakened by its interdimensional journey, the entity fell into slumber, but the damage had already been done. The barriers between Earth and Malifaux had been shattered and weakened. In the millennia that followed, the cracks between these two worlds would occasionally align, creating a temporary passage between realms. In this way, creatures and monsters from Malifaux occasionally slip through to Earth, inspiring myths and legends that would linger into the present day. Nowhere was this more evident than in the culture of the Aztec people. In the 14th century, A portal between Earth and Malifaux opened in the Valley of Mexico, unleashing burned and twisted monsters onto the outskirts of Tenochtitlan. The Aztecs were unprepared for the sudden appearance of such creatures, and the brief glimpse they received of another world, of the blasted and charred plains on the other side of the portal, shook their civilization to its very core. Once the portal had closed, and the monsters had been slain or driven off, the Aztec people struggled to make sense of what they had seen. They believed that the world they had seen through the portal had been a glimpse of the future after the sun had died, and, in an attempt to prevent that future, they turned toward human sacrifice to empower the sun and prevent that dark day from coming. Nearly 300 years later, another portal, this one appearing near New Zealand, would draw the great sea monster known as Horomatanji to Earth. Horo Matanji proceeded to terrorize and feed upon the Maori people for the better part of 50 years, until it was tricked into eating poison that put the mighty beast into a great slumber. Not every portal disgorged monstrous beasts onto earth, however. Midway through the 17th century, a portal was discovered by the people of Abyssinia in eastern Africa. In their curiosity, the Abyssinians explored the seemingly desolate new world and discovered a cache of soul stones. The Abyssinians initially believed these soul stones to be nothing more than normal gemstones. It was only after the portal closed that they discovered the truth. Whenever someone died near a soul stone, the gem would absorb their soul and become charged with magical energy that could then be used to cast spells of incredible power. In the wake of this discovery, Abyssinia became known as a strange and mystical place, whose people could wield terrible magical powers. Over time, however, the owners of these soul stones fought with each other, and gradually the miraculous gems were lost, destroyed, or seized by the government for testing. The dwindling might of Abyssinia proved to be a symptom of a larger problem. All across the world, the power of magic was fading. There were many theories on why this was happening, but nothing that hinted at a way to reverse the trend and restore the power that was ebbing away. The sorcerers, warlocks, soothsayers and wizards of the world eventually came together in 1780 to form the Council, a group dedicated to the restoration of magic. The Council travelled the world in search of answers. They spoke with the shamans of the indigenous tribes of the New World, and debated magical theory with the scholars of Abyssinia, but at every turn they only found more questions. 
Eventually, the Council began to realise that much of their world's magic could be tied back to a second, hidden world, one that occasionally came into conjunction with their own. By the reckoning of these mages, there was a barrier between their world and this second world. After years of research, debate and preparation, the Council finally succeeded in punching a hole through this barrier and created a permanent portal between the two realms, the Great Breach. The devastation was unlike anything that had ever been seen on Earth. In the blink of an eye, the life force was torn from the flesh of the lesser sorcerers as the ritual spiralled out of control and consumed them. A shockwave roared outward from the portal, knocking over buildings and ripping the smaller ones from their foundations. Those few sorcerers and mystics who had managed to shield themselves from the worst of the blast were infused with the raw, magical power of the ritual. Unimaginable power coursed through their veins, allowing them to perform wondrous magical feats that previously would have been impossible for the most learned of archmages. As powerful as they now were, even these mages were humbled by the sight of the portal they had created. They had chosen the city of Santa Fe as the location of their ritual, as it was remote enough to not attract much attention from the governments of the world, and now that city, or its ruins at the very least, was forever linked to a sister city in another dimension. The sign hanging above the city on the other side of the portal proclaimed its name to be Malifo, and the sorcerers applied that name to the newly discovered dimension as well. The announcement of Malifo's existence shocked the world. The council called for the people of the world to travel to Santa Fe, now renamed Breachtown, and cross through the portal to join them in Malifo City. In short order, the abandoned city became a thriving metropolis, a melting pot of the world's most curious and ambitious explorers and scholars. Beyond the city's walls, Boomtown sprang up around the ruins of ancient mining sites. The council had rediscovered the soul stones of Abyssinian legend, and they paid good wages to anyone willing to excavate the magical gemstones from the ground. Everywhere, people experimented with soul stones. Alchemists ground the gems into powder that served as components for magical mixtures and medicines, while inventors and engineers used them as power sources for increasingly complex machines. Across the world, people with no previous magical talent used soul stones to become powerful and influential mages. The animation of the first construct, a machine that was capable of walking and acting with some degree of autonomy, revolutionised the mechanical sciences. The creation and animation of these machines soon became vogue in the city, and functioning machines were sent back through the breach in droves as curiosities for kings and courtiers, objects of careful study for scholars and engineers, and unflinching weapons of warfare for generals and warlords. Amidst all of these wondrous advances, however, a darker threat emerged. The discovery of an ancient grimoire in the necropolis beneath the city gave rise to the first necromancer, a terrible villain who raised an army of the dead and attempted to wrestle control of the city away from the council. Though the nameless necromancer was defeated, it marked a turning point in history. No longer was humanity blind to the terrible danger posed by Malifaux's many hidden secrets. In the winter of 1797, the worst came to pass. Amidst growing aggression from the native population of Malifaux, a loose collection of nightmarish monsters that humanity had taken to calling the Neverborn, a terrible winter storm engulfed the city, trapping its residents indoors around whatever fires they could make. Beyond that, details become scarce. What is known is that the great stone archway that had been built around the breach began to tremble and crack. The breach began to slowly shiver and shrink, and those who pushed against it were rebuffed by a cold blast of wind. Countless soul stones were expended in an attempt to stabilise the breach, but to no avail. Before the breach closed, a body came hurling through the breach. On its torso was carved a single word, Ars. The closing of the breach shocked the world. One moment, Malifaux was a wellspring of magical power, and the next, it was gone. An entire city of people 
vanishing overnight. A great many people from across the world had settled in Malifaux in the decades since the opening of the breach, and not a corner of the world was unaffected by its closing. Memorials sprang up almost overnight. In addition to the colossal loss of human life, the source of the world's soul stones had been lost. The magical gemstones had already been one of the most sought-after commodities in the world, and in one fell swoop it had also become the rarest. Institutions began to hoard their meagre supplies, while governments seized whatever soul stones they could from private citizens. As the years passed, worldwide paranoia settled in. Everyone had seen the power that could be unleashed by those possessing soul stones, and no nation wished to be caught off guard should their neighbours launch an assault to claim their soul stones. Diplomats became spies, and troops mustered along every border. When the first shots rang out in the spring of 1803, it was as if the entire world released a collectively held breath. Fueled by their own meagre collection of soul stones, the Bulgarian people attempted to revolt against the crumbling grip of their Ottoman rulers, triggering a series of cascading alliances and treaties that dragged all of Europe into a war that would later spread to engulf the rest of the world. Unlike previous wars, however, the great nations of Earth now had access to considerable magical power. Among the musket lines and cavalry charges, practitioners wielded eldritch energies and rained down fire upon enemy encampments. Animated constructs marched alongside flesh and blood troops, and some nations, such as Spain, employed necromantically infused soldiers that would continue to fight even after their deaths. In Africa, a loose coalition of soulstone-infused nations marched into Abyssinia from the north, while opportunistic bandits and pirates began gnawing at its borders to the south. They found themselves engaged with a powerful empire that rose to the challenge of war and went on to fight off Egypt, Italy and the Ottoman Empire in numerous fierce battles. Further west, the South American colonies of the Spanish and Dutch launched attacks on Brazil, while Mexico pushed northward, seizing the territory of Texas and its numerous soulstone warehouses from Spain. Everywhere, armies fought and died by the thousands for gems so small they could be set into a ring or brooch. Not every nation was pulled into the initial conflict. The nations of Japan, China and Vietnam, for instance, banded together in an alliance through numerous marriages that tied their royal houses together, becoming the Three Kingdoms. This kept Eastern Asia peaceful for many years, but eventually the increasing weakness of their neighbours could no longer be ignored, and near the end of the war, the Three Kingdoms broke their stalemates and truces and marched on Eastern Europe, Russia and Western North America. The Black Powder Wars, as these conflicts came to be called, were a time of diplomacy, spycraft and open warfare, the likes of which had a lasting impact on Earth. Though the wars had been started for national gain, they were soon hijacked by a second hidden conflict that raged around the world at the same time. A handful of hidden cabals and secret societies had spurned the Council's call to restore the world's magic, and when the Council succeeded in doing just that, they were cast aside and forgotten. After the breach's collapse, however, these shrouded cabals saw their chance and brought prominent generals and politicians into their ranks. It was not one conspiracy, but several, and their members used politics, swords, pistols and lies to outmaneuver each other and the nations they pretended to serve. By the end of the war, one of these sects had gained de facto control over the vast majority of the world's soul stones. They called themselves the Guild of Mercantilers. The Guild chose England as its headquarters and ceded its people into the courts of every major nation on Earth. As the wars came to an end and attention turned toward rebuilding, the Guild passed laws that forbade soulstone ownership by anyone without Guild authorization. Anyone caught violating this ban was executed, often in the presence of the very soulstone they had illicitly obtained. The only way for the nations of Earth to gain access to soulstones was to accept guild liaisons, and these liaisons frequently had a great deal of influence in that nation's politics. 
anyone who refused to dance to the guild's tune was cut off from its soulstones and targeted with embargoes from their more willing neighbours. By dictating the movements of other nations' armies, the guild was able to bring autonomous nations such as India and the Three Kingdoms into line, turning them from independent nations into occupied police states. Only Abyssinia, with its own private caches of soulstones and advanced technologies, seemed able to resist their influence. In under a century, the guild had brought peace to Earth, but it was the peace of a prison, enforced only because none of the prisoners had the power to defy their jailers. Then in 1897, the unthinkable happened. The breach reopened. Initially, the world was engulfed in panic, for there were fears that the Neverborn that had most likely murdered the residents of Malifaux a century earlier had returned to invade Earth. When a month had passed, with no invasion force sweeping out of the portal, the Guild sent its troops through the breach to find an empty Malifaux city waiting for them. The Guild wasted no time in seizing control of Malifaux City. Its priority was to get the Soulstone Mines operational, and in its haste to do so, it offered an open deal to the nations of the world. Send us your convicts, prisoners and undesirables, and we will give you Soulstones in return. Across the world, prisons were emptied, and vagrants were scooped up, slapped into chains, and shipped through the breach to toil in the Guild's Soulstone Mines. The second settlement of Malifaux was fraught with trouble from the very beginning. The Guild's mining operations resulted in a steady increase in more soul stones, but it also gave rise to factions within the city that would come to make life very difficult for the organisation. Most notable was the Miners and Steamfitters Union, which organised the convicts and free miners into a single group that could halt the flow of soul stones back to Earth by striking. Other groups, such as the Resurrectionists, Arcanists and Ten Thunders, fought the Guild in the streets and in the shadows, disrupting its carefully laid plans in public ways. For the first time since the Guild's inception, the nations of Earth had access to another source of soul stones, the Arcanists. This group of sorcerers and mages specialised in smuggling soul stones out of Malifaux and into the eager hands of whichever nation was willing to risk Guild sanction by dealing with them. With each soul stone smuggled out of Malifaux, the Guild lost more power. The money and resources gained by the Arcanists allowed them to continue their fight against the Guild, while the smuggled soul stones gave the nations that purchased them a hidden reserve that was unknown to the Guild. England, in particular, took great advantage of the Arcanist smuggling operations. As the seat of Guild authority, it had been subjected to the worst of the Guild's totalitarian dogma, and the British Parliament was quite frustrated with having been placed in a position of subservience. Bolstered by their hidden stockpiles of smuggled soul stones, and emboldened by the Guild's distraction with the troubling situation in Malifaux, the British people saw their chance. In 1904, the King's Empire declared their independence from the Guild. The announcement shocked the world. The Guild shifted its seat of operations to Vienna, Austria, and imposed sanctions on the King's Empire in the belief that such penalties would bring the insolent nation to its knees. That didn't happen. Instead, Parliament turned to its hidden cache of soul stones, which it used to bribe smugglers and merchant barons to ignore the Guild's trade embargoes. With its supply lines protected, the King's Empire recalled its armed forces back to England, provided the nation with protection in the event that the Guild decided to use more forceful measures of persuasion. The loss of England was a huge blow to the Guild. The organisation had relied heavily upon English troops to enforce its presence in India and the Three Kingdoms, and now that King Edward VII had recalled those soldiers back to England, the Guild was forced to draw upon its own smaller armies to hold those regions. India was the first to resist. In 1905, rebels rose up, overwhelming the small Guild forces occupying their nation. The rebels were quickly crushed by the Guild's trained soldiers and pneumatic constructs, but the fact that the rebels had even been able to make the attempt was enough to place doubts into the minds of world leaders across the globe. Soon, Russia and the Ottoman Empire began to distance themselves from the Guild. 
the leaders of those nations held meetings that didn't involve guild representatives, and their guild-issued soul stones began to be stolen or went missing with alarming frequency. As the guild pulled troops away from the Three Kingdoms to reinforce their troops in India, the oppressed workers and peasants of the Three Kingdoms rose up in a rebellion of their own. Led by a mysterious, masked man known only as the Boxer, the people of the Three Kingdoms fought back against the guild and what they perceived to be a destruction of their traditional values by Western powers. The guild did what it could to fight back against the revolutionaries, but it was fighting a war on two fronts. In the end, it was a threat birthed from the heart of the guild that shattered the tyrannical peace the guild had tried to impose upon the world. For years, the Governor-General of Malifaux City had been quietly enacting a series of rituals designed to allow him to ascend to a higher state of existence, similar to the being that had crashed into Mount Etna thousands of years earlier. Had his plan been successful, Governor-General Kitchener would have cast aside his mortal being and become rulership, an entity capable of crushing the free will of others in order to bring them under his unyielding control. The Governor-General's plan did not succeed. In fact, it failed quite spectacularly. One of the factions vying for control of Malifaux had realised what the Governor-General was trying to do and sabotaged his ritual, giving him far more magical power than any one man could ever hope to control. They had hoped that the deluge of magical energy would simply disintegrate Kitchener's body, but they had underestimated his willpower. They had also not planned for a similar entity to be attracted to the wellspring of magical power unleashed by the ritual. It attempted to feed on the energy, but like two matches flaring to life next to each other, their essences melded into each other and became something greater than either. The governor's mansion exploded around the new entity as it rocked up into space and through the dimensions, its uncontrollable power raging all around it. In a desperate attempt to cling to the last vestiges of what it had been, the entity burned its way backwards through time to appear in the skies above San Francisco. The entity, which would come to be known as the Burning Man, lingered above the city for a week. During that time, incidents of strange behaviour and madness became alarmingly common, and some even began worshipping the man-shaped flames as a deity. A week later, on April 18, 1906, a terrible earthquake struck the city of San Francisco, all but destroying the city. Worse yet, the Burning Man's presence weakened the barriers between worlds, allowing monsters from Malifaux to cross over into Earth to stalk the flaming ruins of the city and feed upon survivors. Through the chaos, the Burning Man drifted above the world, its face twisted in a permanent, silent scream. Over the next few months, it appeared all over the world, sometimes drifting slowly through the sky like a herald of doom, other times simply appearing overhead with no warning. Wherever it went, portals to Malifaux opened in its wake, most lasting for only a few minutes before collapsing in on themselves. The worst of the damage occurred in early June, when the Burning Man was above London. Portals opened all around it, connecting the skies of London to the depths of the Malifaux Ocean. Countless tons of seawater poured into the city, bringing with it twisted monstrosities. Many of these monsters died instantly, killed by the sudden change in pressure or the inability to breathe air, but some survived and either adapted to life above water or slipped into the ocean to spawn and multiply. The Burning Man continues to drift slowly across the world, sowing chaos and madness in its wake. A series of cults have sprung up around the mysterious entity, all of them trying to understand what the man-shaped flame in the sky might mean. A few even possess magic powerful enough to tap into the Burning Man's power and open portals of their own. The sea creatures released into the ocean during the Battle of London have begun to spread across Earth's oceans, and reports of attacks upon fishing, military and leisure boats are on the rise. At the moment, these attacks are restricted to the Atlantic Ocean, but the numbers of the so-called gibbering horde are increasing with each passing day. Rebellions are on the rise all across the Earth, and more nations slip through the Guild's fingers every day. 
England and Abyssinia have both marshaled armies to help defend their lands from the threats unleashed by the Burning Man, and they have begun to seize the resources of their neighbours to help fund their growing war machines. Russia and the Ottoman Empire are still under guild control, but they have been demanding more and more soulstones from the guild, requests that the guild has been forced to grant simply to keep the two behemoths slumbering. Across the ocean, American senators debate the benefits of remaining in the guild, while the Mexican government desperately tries to fight back against the monsters unleashed during the San Francisco earthquake. Worse yet, in some places of the world, an army of the dead has been spotted walking the earth, as if to bear witness to humanity's final days. That brings us to the end of this episode of the Earthside Echo. Join us next time for more Dispatches from Earthside.